Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In this lecture, I wanted to focus on Surah Layl. And Surah Layl is actually um, a continuation of what I spoke about in the previous lecture regarding Surah Shams. So in Surah Shams, there was a lot of talk that centered around the Ru. And Allah gave us a hint that just as we have a Ru that wishes to guide us towards Allah, we have a Nafsa Amara, which is, uh, it plays the role of the Fajur. And I also explained that it's called the Fajur because it, it just wants to split and break open from all of the commands of Allah, from what is halal and haram, sharia, and so on. And it just basically wants to do the things that it desires. And so given this battle between the Ru and the, this Nafsi Amara, the job is that we have to try and follow the path that is correct. And for that purpose, Allah has given us a blessing, which is something we call the guilt which I explained is also called the nafse lavama. So this is also part of Allah's hikmah that he has granted us this. So now this is really Surah Layl is a continuation where Allah is reinforcing the fact that if we are going to follow the desires of the nafsi amara, if we are going to allow this fujur to dominate, as opposed to the ru, then we are choosing to move on a path that leads us towards destruction in this world as well as in the afterlife. It's a path that leads to nothing but stress, anxiety, depression. There is no sukoon, there is no contentment. Now in Surah Lal, this entire discussion is now further elaborated. And that's why it's, it's really a continuation of Surah Shams. And in this uh, Surah, Allah begins by taking oaths. And you will notice there's a lot of similarity, yet a slight difference between the oaths taken here and the oaths taken in Surah Shams. So here Allah says that he is taking an oath by the night when it covers and by the day when it appears. So unlike in the previous case where everything was revolving around the sun, it was revolving around basically the Ru. Allah was talking about, you know, the night when it covers it and the day when it glorifies it. Uh, the idea being that everything was focused around the sun. In this case, Allah does not say by the night when it covers it. He's just saying that he swears by the night when it covers. And he swears by the day when it appears or when it glorifies. Now, of course, we could ask, well, what exactly is the night covering? Okay, the fact that Allah talks about the night when it covers and then he immediately speaks about the day when it glorifies or when it appears then it's clear that Allah is saying he's swearing by the night when it covers the day. And then he t takes an oath by the day when it appears or when it glorifies. Now, he does not say, I swear by the night when it covers and I swear by the day when it covers. Because, uh, because the day also eventually covers the night, just like the night covers the day. But he doesn't say it that way. In other words, he's just focusing on the fact that the day is something that is bright and something that should be glorified. It's beautiful. But the night plays the role of covering up that beauty. It plays the role of covering up all of that brightness. And then after this, Allah says, He also takes an oath by He who created the male and the female. And once these oaths have been taken, the statement that Allah is giving is that, Indeed, your efforts are incredibly diverse. Okay, there's a lot of variation in your efforts. So again, as I told you before, we have to see what is the connection between the oaths that are being taken and the statement that Allah is giving. What is the hidden gems, the hidden message that Allah is trying to give us? Now, again, if you look back at Surah Shams, in that case, because everything was revolving around the sun, all of the oaths were basically focused on the sun. And then the statement that Allah was giving was about the soul. It was about the nafs that he has created, insan, and, and the life that he has given insan. And then he talks about the fajur and the ilham as well as uh, the taqwa. From that, we were able to understand that if the sun is the center which is providing brightness, then therefore it is analogous to the ru. Right? That's why Allah talks about the sun. And then he talks about the nafs. He talks about insan. But over here, when you look at the statement, it's not about the nafs. It's not about insan. The, in, the statement is about the efforts that are being made by insan. So not what insan is made up of but the kind of deeds and efforts and behavior that insan seems to be showing. And in particular, Allah is focusing on the fact that our efforts are, are very, very diverse. And if you continue reading on, then he further talks about the fact that as for he who gives and fears Allah and believes in the best, we will ease him towards the path of ease. But as for he who withholds and considers himself free of need and denies the best, so he denies 
uh, the akhirah, he denies all the truth that Allah has provided, then we will ease him towards difficulty. Okay, so when, when he's talking about the efforts being diverse, then he elaborates that in particular he's talking about people who are making an effort to go towards good and to go towards that which is the truth and people who are making an effort to go towards evil. Now, having understood this entire statement, we can go back and understand why, why has Allah taken these oaths. So therefore, when you revisit the oaths that are being taken, the night is covering up the days. And the day itself, when it appears, it's beautiful and it is something that gives a lot of light and it's something that should be glorified. But the night is shown as something which is evil because it is covering up that beauty. It's covering up the brightness of the day. And so now when you link it to the statements, you can understand that the day is analogous to the truth. All right. The truth, of course, is something which is which should be glorified. It should be spread. It's something which is beautiful and it gives light. So if you are in a room of darkness, the light that you see is, is really that which represents the truth. So therefore, if the day is actually representing the truth, then the night which covers up the day, that must mean that the night is analogous to falsehood because falsehood is that which covers up the truth, right? So in other words, the truth is tawhid. The truth is basically the, the oneness of God and that we have to worship God. But when you cover up the truth with layers and layers of lies and stories and conjectures so that you can pursue your own desires, then what you are left with is a lot of falsehood. Because, you know, all these stories and, and all these lies are designed to cover up that which is really the truth, which is underlying. That's why the job of a true Muslim is to unveil the truth. You have to peel off all the layers of falsehood and, and discover what the actual truth is. And peeling off the layers of falsehood means you have to learn to question. You have to learn to use the akal that Allah has given you. Question as much as you can, do as much research as you can, because the more knowledge you are able to acqu acquire, the more you are peeling off those layers of falsehood and getting back to the truth. And uh, this, by the way, is very similar to uh, when you look at the story of Adam and Iblis, the very first experiment that was done, the very first demonstration that Adam alayhi uh, revealed to the angels as well as to Iblis uh, by the permission of Allah was a demonstration of his immense knowledge, right? So the fact that Allah taught him all of these names and by names, it means a vast amount of knowledge was given to him, all kinds of terminologies. Uh, there was so much information that when Allah asked the angels to provide the names, they could not because they had not been given that kind of knowledge. And it was only Adam salam who was able to provide all that information. So as he displayed the kind of intellect and the kind of abilities to reason that he had, this is what really shocked the angels and it made them understand that this insan is no doubt a very different creation. It has a very advanced level of intellect. Right. And of course, we know that Iblis was there in the crowd, too. And even Iblis could not uh, provide the names. It was only Adam salam, who could do so. So uh, what we understand from that demonstration is that the more knowledge you acquire using that uh, that advanced intellect that Allah has given us, the more we ask questions, the more we ponder, the more we re use reason, the easier it will be for us to discover the truth and the more difficult it will be for Iblis to deceive us. Right? Because deception means that you cover up the truth with falsehood and a person who has no knowledge will never be able to figure it out. A person who does not have knowledge will blindly start following falsehood, believing that it's actually the truth. It is only the person who asks a lot of questions and, and a person who does the, the correct amount of research who will be able to decipher that this is actually false, this is a complete deception. The truth is something entirely different. And then furthermore, in the oaths, Allah is saying, and he takes an oath by he who created the male and female. So he's taking an oath by himself and the fact that he has created male and female. Now, of course, Allah could have said that he has created in son. That would have sufficed. But the fact that he talks about male and female separately, and then he later on talks about the fact that our efforts are diverse, from that, we can understand that when he talks about the man and the woman, men and women have been created in different ways. 
And this is something that psychology and science has also proven, that men have a brain that works in a certain way and women have a brain that, that works in an entirely different way. So women have a mind that is very good at multitasking. So they can think of several different things at the same time. And, you know, they're actually pretty good at doing it. Whereas men can only focus on one thing at one time. Now, of course, you know, that gives women a certain advantage in certain times, but it also gives them a disadvantage, which means they can conduct 10 or 15 tasks at one time, but they cannot focus 100% on any one task because they're focusing on too many tasks. And men, on the other hand, are very poor at multitasking. So they cannot, they cannot do 15 or 20 tasks at one moment. But on the other hand, they have the ability of giving 100% focus to one particular task so they can understand and even memorize and remember the most minute details which we as women will tend to overlook because our brain is too occupied with so many other things that, that you know we're thinking of. And then, of course, you know, besides the way that our brain actually works, when you look at our physical strength, there's an entire difference over there. Men are physically, they have been created to be stronger than women and women are created weaker. So although both have strength inside of them, one gender has been given a greater amount of strength than the other. In the same way, when you look at the traits and qualities that men and women have, for each quality, there is a base level that both genders have. So both genders have a concept of patience, of courage, of showing resilience, um, of showing tenacity, confidence. You know, this is something that both genders have at a, at a very base level. But besides that base level, Allah has given certain traits in a greater amount to men, whilst women are given a greater amount in other kinds of traits. So just as an example, you know, men have a greater ability to uh, give security and give protection to others. They are very vigilant in that. They are always ready to fight or to defend because that is a quality that Allah has placed in them in a greater amount, given the fact that this is, a, this is their primary role providing security and protection to the family. In the same way, when it comes to women, women have a greater amount of love, care to nurture. That is something which is greater in women, which is why women are able to give birth. They are able to look after a baby, especially during the early years when it's very, very difficult. In fact, it is this excessive amount of love, care, and this need to nurture, which is inside women, that is the entire reason they can hold a baby in their womb for nine months, given the discomfort that they end up experiencing. They are still able to do it. Then when they experience the uh, difficulty of giving birth, despite all of that, and then of course the first two years, which are incredibly difficult, they still have the sabr, the patience to look after a baby and to show so much warmth and love and care because this is something the man cannot do. So Allah has provided certain traits to men in a greater amount and certain traits to women in a greater amount. It's not like men do not have the concept of love and care and to uh, provide or to, to nurture. They have the, these feelings as well. But Allah has provided these in greater quantity to the women because the women have a certain role that they have to play in society. So in this way, you know, when you look at men and women, the way they have been constructed emotionally as well as physically, you can understand that Allah has created them different because of the different roles that they have to play in society. And from this, what we also learn is that because men have been created for a certain role and women have been created specifically for a certain role, when we try to go against the roles that Allah has designed us for, because we think that we know better, then in the long run, it always ends in disaster. So if there is a man who decides to stay at home, and he decides that he will not perform the role of uh, you know, protecting and providing and that entire role will be transferred over to the woman, that always leads in harm, it always leads in destruction. Because a man does not have the capability of staying at home and providing love and care and so much nurture to the children. You know, this is something that Allah has not placed in excessive quantity inside men. In the same way, if women choose that they are going to be the bread earners and they don't want to stay at home or, you know, they don't want to look after the kids and, you know, love them or care for them. Instead, they want to spend the entire day working hard and becoming something great in terms of dunya. 
then eventually that leads to extreme exhaustion because women in terms of um, the way that we have been designed physically as well as emotionally, we are more sensitive and we don't have as much physical strength or as much endurance as men do, right? So ultimately it will lead to depression and stress as well. If women decide to play the role that Allah has designed men for and men decide to play the role that Allah has designed women for. Now again, that does not mean that women cannot go out and work or men don't have the ability of showing love and care to children. But what that does mean is that there is an overall responsibility that is on the shoulders of women given the way that they have been designed. And there's an overall responsibility on men given the way that they have been designed. So as long as they are bearing their basic important roles in mind, if they can do anything beyond that, then that is great. But their basic role has to be there because there is sukoon for them in achieving that basic role. So now coming back to the surah, when we understand what the day and night is actually representing, when we understand what is meant by the male and the female and the fact that they have been created in different ways based on Allah's hikmat and Allah's wisdom because Allah knows best, then we can understand that when Allah talks about our efforts being incredibly diverse, what he is implying from that is that each and every one of us has been given a certain set of traits and qualities that, are, that make us unique. So if there are billions of people in this world, every single individual has a certain combination of traits and qualities that makes him unique and distinct from everyone else. So just like Allah created men and women for their specific roles and he gave them the capabilities, he gave them the qualities that they, need, that they needed to be successful in that role, in the same way each and every one of us has our own distinct set of traits. So the exact amount of sabr or courage or intellect um, or the amount of endurance and resilience that each and every one of us has is going to be different from the person next to us. And that is what makes us unique. And Allah has given us that exact set or that exact amount of traits and qualities because he has designed us for something. And that is why Allah says that all of our efforts are diverse. He could have made us all as robots. He could have made us all exactly the same, but he has chosen to make us different, not just in terms of our appearance, but also our internal chemical and hormonal makeup. The account of, the amount of emotions we have, the amount of qualities we have, everything is different. Every human being is unique. And so what Allah is telling us is that I have given you and made you unique because there are certain efforts that I am requiring from you. And that is what is most beautiful. So use whatever traits and qualities that Allah has given you, whatever strengths and abilities that Allah has given you, and use it to strive in the cause of Allah. And this actually is really important. It's not like Allah is expecting all of us to become scholars or that he's expecting all of us to become great motivational speakers. He is expecting us to become whatever it is that we can become given the qualities that we have. So if someone is very creative, then he has to use that creativeness in the cause of Islam. If someone is very good at teaching young kids, then he should use that in the cause of Islam. If someone is very eloquent in his speech, he should use that in the cause of Islam. So based on, you know, whatever that bundle of strengths is that Allah has given you, use that, identify it first of all, accept it, embrace it, and then use it in the cause of Islam. That is the reason why Allah has created you. And then if you were to use your strengths for something other than the reason that Allah has created you, so if you use it to pursue evil, if you use it to pursue dunya, if you use it to chase your own dreams and desires, then you are moving towards destruction. In the same way that Allah has created men for a certain role, if they choose to go against Allah's hikmat, then they are moving towards destruction. Women have been created for a certain role. If they choose to go against it, they're moving towards destruction. So in the same way, me and you have been created for our own specific role. There is a service that Allah is expecting from each and every one of us. We have to find it, identify it, and strive towards it. But if we choose to use it for something other than the, the reason Allah gave it to us, then we are moving towards destruction. And now combining this, with the concept of night and day, with the concept of truth and falsehood. What Allah is telling us is that for those of us who will use our resources, our strengths, our inner traits and qualities that Allah has given us, to fear Allah, to believe in that which is the best, 
and by the best it means to believe in the truth. The truth is always the best and falsehood is always the worst. So Allah is saying, for those of us who choose to fear God and believe in that which is husna, that which is the best, which means tawheed, which means the absolute truth, then Allah will ease him towards ease. So Allah will make that path of Islam incredibly easy for them. And in contrast, those of us who choose not to fear Allah, those of us who feel that we are superior, we have all these strengths and qualities, Allah did not give this to us. These are things that we have earned. So we end up actually worshipping ourselves and we believe that we are free of need. And there is nothing, there is no harm that Allah can possibly do to us, nor can he benefit us because we are perfectly in control of our lives and of our fate. And the person who ends up therefore denying the truth. So he's so much in love with himself and he's so confident about his own qualities and his own traits that he denies the truth and he only likes to follow that which is falsehood. So he loves following conjectures, stories, things have, that have no basis. He loves to follow a twisted version of Islam. So he's not happy with the actual truth that Allah has sent. He's not happy with the commands and injunctions that Allah has sent or with the Sharia that Allah has sent. He likes to pick and choose. So there are certain things that he's very happy following and there are certain things that he deliberately chooses to just deny and ignore. If that is the case, Allah says we will ease him towards difficulty. Now what that actually means is that when you are following a path other than the path which Allah has designed for you, as I just spoke about when it comes to the male and the female, they will then move towards destruction. They will move towards depression and anxiety because they are, they are adopting a role which Allah has not designed them for. They are going against their fitra. They are going against the wisdom of Allah and they are moving towards depression and destruction. In the same way, Allah is saying, if you decide to move towards that which I have not created you for, so I created you to follow the truth, but you choose to follow falsehood, then Allah will ease that path. And this is a path that is moving you towards difficulty. It's moving you towards anxiety and stress and depression. And the reason it's doing that is because the more you move on this path, the more you are denying the needs of your ruh, which we learned in Surah Shams. You are ignoring that spiritual element inside of you that, that yearns for a connection with the Creator. So you might be able to get a lot of wealth, you might be able to get a lot of assets in this world, but at the end of the day, you will be completely discontent. You will have a lot of anxiety and you will feel empty on the inside. And this is the reason why Allah says, and what will his wealth avail him when he falls? In other words, when that time of destruction comes, when that time of depression and stress comes, which will come also in this dunya, but of course the ultimate will come in the akhirah, Allah is saying at that time that his wealth will not be able to help him. And this is really important. Wealth, fame, everything that is linked to dunya will of course not help you on the day of judgment when you're standing in front of Allah. But it will also not help you in this dunya when you are moving towards depression and stress. Because, you know, when things start to fall apart, when you start to have that feeling of emptiness, when you start to feel a lot of anxiety and stress and fear, and, you know, you are moving towards hopelessness and a lot of negativity, wealth cannot buy you that happiness. So you can go and spend as much as you want. You can go around shopping and doing all kinds of things, travel the world if you have to. You will still come back with that feeling of emptiness. In the same way, you can be the most popular person, you can have a lot of followers, you can have a lot of fame, but nobody is going to be able to help you if you are down in depression. No one is going to be able to give you the words of sukoon that you are actually looking for or that life of purpose, that life of meaning that you are looking for. Because people are slaves of Allah themselves. They are, each and every human being is looking for sukoon himself. How can he provide you with sukoon? Each and every human being is trying to understand what he needs to give himself a contentment. How can he possibly know what you need for contentment? And this is a beautiful lesson that we see in Surah Lail. That there are two paths. One is leading to a path that will be filled with ease. So in the beginning, there is a lot of hurdles and obstacles in Islam. But eventually, there is nothing but sukoon and contentment and long-term happiness. But on the other path that you choose, there is nothing in the long term but grief and anxiety, incredible fear of the future and depression.
And as a result, Allah then continues by saying, Indeed, incumbent upon us is guidance. So Allah will provide guidance to everyone. He will give you the opportunity to hear the words of Islam. He will provide you with the correct information so that your heart can testify that this is what I was designed for. This is the path that I need to move towards. This is my fitrah. And Allah says, indeed, to us belongs the akhirah as well as the first, which means that this dunya as well as the dunya that is coming after this, Allah is going to be the king of both worlds. And at the same time, what this means is whatever you are experiencing now, whatever you have experienced in the past, and whatever is coming ahead for you, Allah is in control of everything. So Allah says, I have warned you of a fire which is blazing, and no one will be able to enter and burn in it except the most wretched one. And who is that? The one who denied and turned away. And so he was given an opportunity to understand the truth. He testified to the truth. He knew what he was designed for and what he should be doing, but he decided to ignore it and turn away. And so how many of us tell ourselves that I know I should be praying, but for some reason I just cannot do it? I know I should be studying uh, you know, the Quran and I should be studying God's message, but I just don't have time for it. I know there are certain commands of Allah that I'm not fulfilling, but hopefully I'll do it later when I'm older you know, and I, I, I have more time. Right now it's just too hard for me. I know I should be you know, concerned about earning halal income, but right now it's important for me to amass wealth, so halal or haram, it, it really doesn't matter. I know that there are certain relationships that Allah has made clear are haram, and they are not permissible in Islam, but you know, I just cannot seem to be able to control my heart. So this is the category that we end up fall, falling in. We are denying and turning away from something that we already know is the truth. And we're coming up with the most lame excuses. And that's why when we move towards depression and anxiety, we then turn back and say, Allah, why am I depressed? Why, why do I have so much anxiety? Why do I have so much stress? It doesn't make any sense. Well, just look back at your life and you'll be able to understand why you have it. Because there were two paths. You chose the path that is moving towards falsehood. And you chose to ignore the path that was moving towards the truth. You chose to use all the qualities and traits that Allah had given you to pursue your desires, to chase this, this dunya, to do all the things that you believed in your heart was good. And you chose to not use it for the actual purpose Allah had given it to you. And then Allah says, but for the righteous one, he will avoid it. He will avoid Jahannam. He who gives from his wealth to purify himself. He doesn't like to amass it. He loves to give it and not giving for anyone who has done him a favor to be rewarded. So he doesn't give out seeking something in exchange. It's not about uh, you know, material benefits. It's not about, okay, I'll give you this, but what exactly do I get, get from you? He's not concerned about that because Allah says all he's seeking is the countenance, the face of his Lord, the Most High. He only wants the pleasure of Allah. He, Allah saying, is going to be satisfied. So what he is moving towards in this dunya as well as in akhirah is going to be something that will be that will give him sukoon because he's not looking for this world. He's not looking for any material benefit. It's all about seeking Allah's face, seeking Allah's happiness. That's all that matters. So if he helps someone and the person doesn't even say thank you, he doesn't care. All he cares about is, I hope Allah has accepted my effort. In this regard, we really have to sit and think and ask ourselves right now, which path are we following? And this, in fact, is uh, also one of the most unfortunate things because uh, as we have seen in the surah, Allah has provided each and every one of us with a unique bundle of strengths. And many of us don't even know what our strengths are. We are filled with so much inferiority complex that we think that we are good for nothing. We think that we are a failure. Just because somebody told us that we are a failure, just because somebody abandoned us or somebody said something harsh or mean to us, we end up believing those people and thinking that we are good for nothing. So instead of uh, using our strengths to, to do something great for Islam, we are actually denying the fact that Allah has given us any strengths. And we end up believing that, you know, we are practically worthless. When Allah is saying, I've made each and every one of you unique, I have given you amazing qualities and strengths. I have designed you for a particular service that I had in mind. 
and f and for that service to help you in achieving that i've given you the exact combination of every trait that you need but instead of using it we we aren't even accepting that we have anything and this is what the surah is really highlighting that strive towards that goal that allah has designed you for and that goal is allah's happiness and allah's uh, face but in order to achieve that you can do it in any way that you want you could be a teacher of islam you could be a scholar of islam you could be a, an author or a writer about islam you could be teaching kids or you could be teaching the older generation whatever it is that allah has given you find it accept it embrace it and use it for the cause of attaining allah's happiness that is the path that not only will give us success in the akhirah but in this dunya it will free us of depression and anxiety and grief and this fear of the future it will give us a contentment and peace that we cannot even explain and that is allah's promise may allah make it easy for us all to understand what it is that allah has d designed us for may allah enable us to use those strengths and those qualities that allah has given us for something great in the cause of islam may allah forgive us all of our sins and may allah enable us all to attain salvation assalamu alaikum